Welcome everyone to the review session. Um, for those of you who are signing up to take the final, and I hope it's only those people that are really in danger of not passing the class. So those of you who are simply trying to gamble on getting a higher grade, please do not sign up. Um, let the people who are really in need of getting their grade up into the passing range take the exam. The exam, as I mentioned on uh, the announcements page on D2L, I've scheduled a room, uh, McKenzie Hall 3198 at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, March 17th. Uh, it's a building up on top of the hill, not at the south waterfront. Uh, and so I will be looking in my inbox uh, to see who is signing up for that. And hopefully there won't be more than 20 people because that's the most that PSU will let you meet as a group uh, according to their new policies. All right, so let's start the review, which I would have been giving today, this being Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, let's start with open reading frames. So open reading frames uh, have to do with the triplet code. And in a messenger RNA, you can start the triplet code at any particular nucleotide. And since you're counting in threes, they can be one nucleotide out of frame with each other. And if you look through a messenger RNA, you will find that the reading frames that are not true open reading frames will be littered with stop codons, which will happen from time to time, time, to time just due to random chance. And so for in this example, the bottom uh, reading frame would be the open reading frame that actually contains the message because the top two have stop codons. And remember when you're looking at DNA, you have the potential for six open reading frames, three on each strand. And unless you know which one of those strands is being transcribed, it's possible that you could have open reading frames in either one of them. Okay, so let's talk about translation since that's really what this section started with. Uh, and we talked about tRNAs, transfer RNAs, um, and how they are involved in protein synthesis. So in a tRNA, you have several features. They have this cloverleaf pattern when you look at them in two dimensions at least. And they include features such as the D arm, the T arm, the anticodon at the bottom, and the three prime CCA, which is the site for amino acid attachment. And these tRNAs act as the intermediaries in protein translation by reading the genetic code from the messenger RNA through base pairing with the anticodon. And we also talked about the fact that some of these uh, tRNAs have a wobble at the uh, three prime end of the codon. So this is because there are modified nucleotides in tRNAs and in some cases they have inosine put on this position and that allows different base pairing with several different nucleotides on the mRNA. Remember that the wobble actually occurs at the three prime end of the codon on the mRNA, but it's actually at the five prime end of the anticodon on the tRNA. So keep that in mind. We also talked about the translation cycle and how it's different in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And so um, make sure you're aware of the differences between the two. And I don't really have time to go through all the differences, uh, so I'll just point out a couple of the highlights. Um, in both cases, though, you start with um, one of the three sites occupied with the first initiator RNA. Remember, those three sites are the E site, the P site, and the A site. And Entering tRNAs normally enter in at the A site, but when you initiate, you start with the tRNA at the P site, and then you add the incoming next amino acid at the A site, 
and that continues uh, and the ribosome shifts down the messenger RNA. For translational initiation in bacteria, you need an initiator tRNA, which does bind in the P site and incorporates a formulated methionine, which is a uh, chemically modified methionine residue. Um, and it's critical for having this uh, binding complex between the small ribosomal subunit, the mRNA, and the initiator tRNA, uh, which then allows the large ribosomal subunit to associate with it. So in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the initiator RNA is in the P site at first. And eukaryotic initiation occurs slightly differently. Um, you start with the methionine uh, put into the small ribosomal subunit uh, bound to elongation factor, um, initiation factor, sorry, IF2 with GTP. And remember that there is a number of modifications uh, that occur to the mRNA, uh, including the 5' prime cap, the 3' prime poly A tail, and the poly A tail binding proteins, and that this initiator complex has to assemble all those components together onto the messenger RNA, which then slides down the messenger RNA until it finds the uh, start AUG site and then allows it to elongate. And the elongation, again, starts with the tRNA in the P site and an incoming messenger, or incoming tRNA coming into the A site. And that the next step is to connect the amino acids from the tRNAs in the P site and the A site together to um, make the polypeptide. And that's done by peptidyl transferase. And then after that, peptide bond is made, then the ribosome undergoes a change in position and ratchets the uh, now empty uh, tRNA to the E site and ratchets the incoming tRNA to the P site, which then allows for a new tRNA to bind to the A site, and then the original tRNA exits from the E site. We also talked about the fact that antibiotics mostly are directed at ribosomes, and that's because of the very important nature of ribosomes and protein synthesis to all living organisms. Uh, there are a few that bind to RNA polymerases, but those are definitely not the majority of antibiotics. We also talked about the fact that as the protein is being made from the ribosome, it's starting to fold as it's coming out. And there are some proteins that fold autonomously into domains as they come out of the ribosome, but not all of them. And there are some that require help in folding, and those uh, get help from chaperones. And chaperone proteins can then take the molten globule that's originally folded and help that to fold into a productive uh, protein. And again, if this fails, then the irretrievable accidents that you get from this are degraded by the proteasome, which is the trash can there. Um, otherwise, there are several different kinds of chaperones that we talked about that can be involved in this. And then uh, we talked a little bit about cloning. Uh, and specifically, we're talking here about um, uh, somatic cell uh, nuclear cloning, uh, which is the, the correct name for this sort of a process. Um, this is distinct from the sense of cloning we were talking about before in which we're talking about taking a piece of exogenous foreign DNA and putting it into um, another organism. So in this case, just to recap how this is done in mammalian systems, um, you take an unfertilized egg cell and remove its DNA and then put into it the 
fully diploid DNA from a somatic cell from a donor, and that's put in next to the unfertilized egg cell, which is now lacking its uh, original DNA and pulsed with electricity. It allows the two cells to fuse, and then you get a zygote, which then goes on to become an embryo. And uh, the fact was that uh, Dolly uh, and her offspring, Polly, um, were developed by this particular process. Um, we then talked about sequence specific interactions between DNA binding proteins. And we started off with a common motif that's found in bacterial uh, DNA binding proteins, which is the helix turn helix motif. And in the helix turn helix, there are two helices um, that are alpha helices. The first one binds into the major groove of the DNA, and that's referred to as the recognition helix. And then there's a, a floppy, flexible turn segment that then allows the second alpha helix to be oriented at a different angle than the recognition helix. And that also binds to the DNA, but not in the major groove. And it stabilizes the binding of the major groove through other weak interactions with the DNA alpha or double helix. We also talked about different types of um, DNA binding proteins, particularly ones that are found in eukaryotes, like leucine zipper proteins, in which there's a dimerization interface where hydrophobic residues like leucines are found on one face of the uh, alpha helix, and that allows two of these alpha helices to come together and bond to each other through hydrophobic interactions. And these can be either homodimer, in other words, the same protein, or heterodimers, where you can take two different proteins that are both leucine zippers. And this allows for variability in the DNA binding region. We also talked about helix loop helix proteins, uh, which are slightly different than that, and really are more like leucine zippers than they are like the helix turn helix motifs, in that you have a helix that binds to the, the major groove, like a leucine zipper does, but then the um, carboxyl end, as shown here, um, has a big loop structure, and the top part, the two helices up there, interact with each other, and so it's not quite as uh, straight an interface as you have with a leucine zipper. We also talked about another common motif, which are zinc finger binding proteins, which, as the name implies, have a zinc uh, residue coordinated into the center of it. And uh, these are, are there's many types of these. Um, the amino acids that interact with the zinc are typically in a certain motif, like cysteine, excess cysteine, uh, and then on the other side, a histidine, XXX histidine or it can be all cysteines. And there are several examples of these that are nuclear hormone receptors and other transcription factors. We also talked about the fact that many of these uh, DNA binding proteins um, and cis-regulatory element binding proteins are in fact um, dimers. And the thing about the dimers is that they give different binding kinetics. So in the left-hand panel A shows that if you have uh, two dimers that are always attached to each other, they're going to bind to a cis-regulatory element in a saturable fashion and give this hyperbolic type uh, curve, which is uh, very classic for um, saturation binding curves. But if you first have to have the two, set, the two um, proteins that are in the dimer assemble with each other first before they can bind to the cis regulatory element, um, that gives you a concentration gradient that is sigmoidal. And the reason for that is that you get no binding at all to the cis regulatory element at low concentrations um, because the two pieces of the dimer have to find each other first. And it's not until you get a high enough concentration that they bind to each other that they can then bind to the cis-regulatory element. 
So the advantage of this is that you get more of an on-off switch um, if you have this kind of a binding interaction with two proteins that have to find each other before they can bind to the cis regulatory element. And then we talked about the model system du jour, which was the LAC operon. And we talked about the fact that the LAC operon has a number of important sites to it, and it's regulated by an operator site and a cap binding site. So in the RNA polymerase binding site, in other words, the promoter region, there is a downstream operator, um, which is right in the area where the RNA synthesis is going to start. And that if, in fact, you have a situation where you have high glucose and high lactose, the operon is off because you don't have the catabolite activator protein bound to it. Um, and the whole point of the LAC operon is only to express it when you are in a situation where you have not enough energy from glucose, but you have lactose around in order to metabolize. So in these two examples, the first one you have high glucose and high lactose, you don't need the operon on because you're getting enough energy from the glucose, and therefore the cap site is not bound. Um, in the second example, you've got glucose but no lactose, and therefore the lac repressor is sitting on the site um, because, again, you have enough energy and you don't have lactose to metabolize. And in the third example, the operon's off because although you have no glucose, that means that you have a lot of cyclic AMP to bind to the cap protein. That would normally stimulate this, but you don't have lactose, and so the repressor is bound. It's only in the situation where you have low glucose, meaning high cyclic AMP levels, that's bound to cap, that's going to stimulate RNA polymerase, and you have lactose around, which will bind to the repressor and remove it, that you get the operon to turn on. And the tryptophan uh, repressor mechanism is different. So the trip repressor binds to its operator site only when you have tryptophan around. And that's because you don't need to synthesize tryptophan. So this is not breaking down tryptophan. This is an operon to make tryptophan. So it's different than the LAC operon where you're making or you're breaking down the, um, the lactose. Here, you're actually making the tryptophan. So in the situation where you don't have enough tryptophan, the inactive repressor is not bound. The RNA polymerase is free to transcribe the genes. But if you have tryptophan, then it binds to the repressor and shuts it off, which is a way of sensing that, yes, we've got enough tryptophan. We don't need to make the genes downstream, which would otherwise be used to synthesize new tryptophan. We also talked about the initiation factors that are used in E. coli and other prokaryotes. Uh, these are not used in eukaryotic uh, systems. Uh, they're peculiar to uh, and much simpler with prokaryotic systems. And the standard sigma factor is sigma 70 shown here. Um, and that allows most promoter elements to be recognized by the RNA polymerase. But there are also other sigma factors that can be substituted in, like sigma 32, which then allows the RNA polymerase to recognize genes that are to be induced during a heat shock situation. So it changes the recognition site for the RNA polymerase and where it binds. And similarly, with some of these other sigma factors, um, for example, uh, sigma 28, if you're in a situation where um, you've used up all your nutrients and the bacteria are now in stationary phase, sigma 28 allows certain genes to be turned on by recognizing a new binding site uh, for the RNA polymerase that's normally not recognized by the sigma 70 factor. And that allows you to survive under conditions of stationary stress. We then talked a little bit about a couple of ways that you can 
measure DNA binding proteins. And we talked about EMSA, the electrophoretic mobility shift assay. And this is a way of qualitatively identifying proteins in a nuclear extract that bind to various DNA fragments. And so this is a way that you can uh, use, as we showed here, to chromatograph different um, DNA binding proteins uh, using this assay to see where they come off of some kind of chromatographic column. We also talked about DNA affinity chromatography, where if you have a, a particular DNA um, segment and you want to know what proteins bind to it, this is a way to very specifically get uh, those DNA binding proteins and only those DNA binding proteins that will recognize a certain sequence. So if you know the sequence and you don't know what proteins bind to it, this is a good way to identify those proteins. We also talked about DNA footprinting, which is a very high resolution way of determining where on a DNA strand a particular DNA binding protein binds. So you would use this in the situation where you have a purified DNA binding protein you know roughly what DNA fragment it binds to, and this allows you to find map where that binding site is. Uh, we also talked about CELEX, which is systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment, um, which allows you to identify what DNA sites may bind to a particular DNA binding protein. So this requires that you have a purified DNA binding protein and allows you to look for those sequences of DNA that can potentially bind to it. So in a sense, it's the opposite of DNA affinity chromatography, where you know what the DNA sequence is and you're looking for the proteins. Here you know what the protein is and you're looking for the DNA sequences that can bind to that. And then finally, we talked about CHIP, or chromatin immunoprecipitation, and some of the modifications um, thereby. And it's good for finding out if you have a purified DNA binding protein, and more importantly, an antibody to that DNA binding protein, you can find out at any given time under any given condition in a cell what DNA sequences that is binding to. So it allows you to interrogate the cell in a certain time, in a certain place, under a certain condition to find out what DNA sequences are being recognized by your favorite DNA binding protein. And in this case, uh, you literally sequence the DNA at the end uh, to determine what those sequences are. And you can identify multiple sequences uh, if, in fact, your DNA binding protein binds to a number of them. Then we talked about uh, the binding of DNA proteins uh, during transcription and how you can get synergistic effects by having multiple um, DNA binding proteins to that. So if these are, are all uh, activators of transcription, you add one of them and you get one unit of transcription. You add two of them and you get, let's say, two units of transcription. But if you have the two of them together, you get way more than three units of transcription. You get more like a hundred um, in this example. So the fact that you have multiple transcription factors, uh, activators, or um, repressors bound um, makes their effect greater than any one of them individually. We also talked about. Um, ways that you can remodel chromatin to either activate or inactivate particular regions of the DNA uh, to make it more or less accessible for transcription. And uh, four of the methods that were shown here were um, to use a chromatin remodeling complex, which literally pushes the histones up and down uh, from their normal position in the nucleosome. Uh, another way to do it is uh, through the use of histone chaperones, which can literally remove the histones uh, from the nucleosome, or other histone chaperones, which can substitute uh, different histones, which are more amenable to transcription or not. 
um, and allow transcription to occur um, by exchanging the histones. And we also talked about um, histone modifying enzymes where you can actually modify the histone itself either through uh, methods like acetylation or methylation or ubiquitination or phosphorylation to change the amino terminal tails of the histone which can regulate transcription either positively or negatively. So those are four ways that uh, chromatin could re be remodeled. And we talked about activators and the fact that um, activators can do a number of things. In the top example this activator that's bound in green can promote the binding of additional regulators and that allows for the synergistic effects that we just saw. Um, the activator could potentially recruit the RNA polymerase to the promoter and allow the assembly of the entire complex. Um, or we've also seen an example where a, uh, a, an activator bound to an enhancer element actually releases the RNA polymerase to begin transcription. And normally the RNA polymerase is sitting there in the pre-initiation complex and it isn't until you get the activator bound to the enhancer region that the RNA polymerase is released. And then a second and rarer example is similar to that in which the RNA polymerase may have paused on the DNA and this uh, allows the release of that uh, to go further. We also talked about repressors, and remember repressors, like um, activators, can act at quite a distance, and that's what's shown by the dotted line in the bottom there, that sometimes these are thousands of base pairs away from the actual transcriptional uh, binding site for RNA polymerase. Uh, repressors can work in direct and indirect methods, uh, we talked a little about some of the indirect um, things that can happen having to do more with chromatin remodeling, but the direct effects can be things such as competitive DNA binding where the repressor will bind to a DNA site that could be uh, occupied by an activator, and that just prevents the activator from binding there and thereby uh, represses the gene. Uh, also, you could have a binding site for repressor that's separate from the binding site for the activator, but the repressor itself literally masks the activating surface of the activator. And usually these are uh, proteins that are supposed to do this so that the uh, repressor is a, a true regulatory protein that recognizes a particular activator. And then the third way shown here um, is uh, the fact that you can have a binding site for repressor that actually allows it to act, uh, interact directly with the transcriptional apparatus, sh shown here, uh, binding to um, transcription factor 2D, which is the Tata binding protein. And then we talked a little bit about um, gene expression during uh, embryonic development. And we talked about the example of even skipped, uh, or the Eve gene. And the take home message from this is that you can get expression of genes in a positional dependent manner by having concentration gradients of transcription factors. And uh, Bicoid and Hunchback, for example, are ones that are expressed towards the anterior side of a developing embryo. And so they're highest at the anterior end and lowest at the posterior end. And you could have concentrations of both positive and negative uh, elements here. So bicoid would be an example of a positive activator. Uh, hunchback would be an example of a positive activator. And then you have inhibitors like giant, uh, which is expressed in two different regions and cripple uh, which is uh, anterior down towards the posterior end of hutchback and bicoid. And the expression of any particular uh, of these uh, even skipped genes has to do with which of these transcription factors are bound at any one of these sites uh, in their uh, particular gene regulatory region. And so it's you get different combinations of these binding depending on where you are in the embryo and what transcription factors are present in highest and lowest amounts 
at that particular site in the embryo. We talked a little about yeast mating type switching and how there, is, there are two uh, genders, if you will, of yeast. There's alpha type and A type. And both of them have, um, are encoded within the genome, but they're kept in a silent cassette. And they're um, replicated into the mat locus through a process that's very similar to um, homologous recombination so that the um, different silent cassette can then be uh, duplicated at the mat locus, and they're only expressed when they're at the mat locus. And so the, um, at the top example, you've got the alpha cassette in the mat locus, and the bottom one, you've got the A-type in the mat locus. And again, it should be emphasized that you never lose the original silent cassette uh, they're always present, and that allows you to switch back and forth from one mating type to another, uh, depending on where the yeast find themselves. And the uh, mating type is controlled by gene products from both the alpha and the um, A um, mating type cassettes. So in the case of the A mating type, there's one protein made, MAT-A1, and that actually is, is not involved with anything in the haploid form of the A type. But in alpha, you have two proteins made, the MAT alpha 1 and MAT alpha 2. MAT alpha 1 actually is involved in uh, uh, um, having the alpha genes turned on. Um, and without it, you don't get them turned on, which is why they're not turned on in the A type. Um, however, they actively, the alpha, MAT alpha 2 actively inhibits transcription from the A genes, um, which normally are just constitutively on in the A phenotype. However, if you now have mating and you have a diploid, the genes that you get expressed are the MAT alpha 2 and the MAT A1. The MAT A1 coming from the A, A type and the alpha, MAT alpha 2 coming from the alpha. And those conspire to both shut off the uh, A type genes. Um, you don't have the correct transcriptional factor MAT al alpha 1 to get the alpha genes made. And the two of those together stimulate the genes um, or turn off the genes for. Um, the haploid genes, and so only diploid specific genes are made in the case of the diploid form where you're expressing both alpha and A type genes. And then we talked about lambda, and lambda, the genetic switch from lysis to lysogeny, um, and this particular state, if it's uh, in its prophage state, which is where it's integrated into the DNA, the chromosome of the, the cell, if it's an E. coli, for example, um, the way this works is that the lambda repressor is made and sits on the operator site. And in that situation, you turn off the crow genes, um, but the CI genes, which encode for the repressor itself, are made. And so it keeps it in this lysogenic state um, until it senses that the situation is right for it to go into a lytic state and make new virion lambdas and blow up the cell. So when that happens, um, you don't have a lot of the lambda repressor made, which then um, allows the crow gene to be made. And the crow gene then turns on all the downstream events that are involved in uh, the formation of the lambda phage itself, packaging, um, and the rest, and then it allows it to go into the lytic phase. And this brought up the idea of gene regulation circuits, and there were four that we talked about. Uh, one is a positive feedback loop, which is sort of like the, the lambda repressor, that when you make the gene product A, it binds back to its own uh, operator region and makes more A, so it stimulates it to make more of it. 
The negative feedback loop is where once you've made enough A, it goes and binds to an operator region of its own and shuts itself off. And by using combinations of this, you can make what's referred to as a flip-flop device or an indirect positive feedback loop where the protein made from the A gene then stimulates the production of B. B then goes back and shuts off the production of A, which may seem like a futile cycle, except that these are events that are happening in time. And so what this does is allows you to have things like circadian rhythms, where um, A is expressed up until the point that you make enough B, and then it's shut off, and then you repeat the whole cycle over again. And that's different than a feed-forward loop, where A can activate both B and the final downstream gene Z, but only if it's got B around. So A will not make enough of Z by itself. It needs to have some B made in order for Z to be made. What that allows you to do is to prevent transient expression of A from directly activating Z until enough time has gone by to make enough B to work synergistically with A. So this actually acts as a noise filter to prevent transient expression of genes under uh, conditions where you don't want them to be expressed necessarily. Um, we also talked about X inactivation, and this is done on the X chromosome, uh, half of the X chromosomes in females are shut off through this, uh, and they're shut off apparently randomly. So 50% of the maternal and 50% of the paternal chromosomes are shut off uh, across a uh, female organism, uh, and it varies from cell to cell as to which one is um, shut off. And this is done um, through the XIC locus the X inactivation center locus, which makes the exist RNA. And this is an RNA, it's a non-coding RNA, but it coats the entire X chromosome. And it starts from the XIC site. So it, it kind of walks down the chromosome um, one at a time. It doesn't transfer in trans over to the other X chromosome, which is why it only inactivates one. So it spreads hand over hand, and then it recruits uh, things like histone modifying proteins and shuts off the expression of everything from that chromosome uh, and allows it to, to condense into a bar body, uh, which is inactive. So there's a whole series of events that happen. You get, um, after you get the uh, X chromosome coated with the exist RNA, you get the histone's hypoacetylated, so the acetylation on the histone uh, amino termini are removed. And remember, that particular modification of histone acetylation is usually associated with um, a looser structure and easier to transcribe genes. So when you don't have it acetylated, it can be more condensed, and particularly if they're methylated, which is the next step that happens, um, then they become inactive. And you can use alternative histones like H2A, and then ultimately this leads to DNA methylation, which definitely turns everything off at that point. Um, <clears throat> and with methylation, we talked about epigenetic inheritance and how DNA methylation can be inherited. And the first one shows that you have, uh, once you get a DNA methylase um, activated, and this is a, a DNA maintenance methylase, um, then once that divides, you can um, replicate that um, to all the daughter cells, and they will retain that particular pattern. Um, and that's very similar to what we saw with uh, licensing of the E. coli origin of replication, um, where you had to have the double strand methylation in order to reinitiate uh, replication at the origin for E. coli, and it hemimethylated DNA where only one strand is methylated will not reinitiate. And we talked about histone modifications and how those can be inherited as well. And those are both epigenetic mechanisms that act in cysts. 
And then we talked about ones that act in trans, and that would be an example of uh, a positive feedback loop where you have a protein being made that stimulates its own transcription. And if the daughter cells inherit enough of that uh, protein, then they will activate their own genes and make more of this activator protein. And we talked also about um, protein aggregation states and how particularly misfolded proteins um, can go on to act almost like molecular chaperones, <coughs> excuse me, and um, misfold otherwise normally folded proteins into the same misfolded state. Uh, and that happens in things like Alzheimer's and mad cow disease. We also talked a little about, <coughs> excuse me, I hope I don't have COVID-19, uh, regulated nuclear export and how this is done particularly in HIV-1, uh, where you get the unspliced mRNA transported out of the nucleus. Remember, we talked about the fact that unspliced mRNAs are normally retained within the nucleus and are rapidly degraded if they make it into the cytosol. But the HIV uh, virus overcomes that by having the unspliced bi uh, RNA bind to the Rev protein and that allows it to be transported into the cytoplasm because that's where it's going to be packaged into the viral uh, virions. So you want to have the unspliced RNA packaged, uh, and that's how you get it out of the nucleus is through this special Rev protein. Otherwise, we talked about normally if, if a, an RNA doesn't have uh, the splicing uh, completed uh, and you don't have the five prime uh, cap and the three prime uh, poly A tail, it's going to be rapidly degraded. We talked a little bit about um, silencing RNAs, um, and these would be um, ways that you can shut off gene transcription. And one of them uh, we talked about, or at least uh, was in uh, Dr. Stedman's uh, talk on this, uh, since I didn't give this uh, this morning, is DICER. <clears throat> and um, this is a way that uh, double-stranded RNAs, uh, which would typically be from a virus, um, can be cut into short uh, siRNAs, silencing RNAs, through uh, this uh, endonu or endonuclease dicer. And it recruits argonaut and other um, risk factors um, to make this complex that then will inhibit um, the RNA polymerase and shut off transcription at that point. So it's the the action of these the series of proteins, the dicer cutting it up, and the risk proteins and argonaut um, then changing the way these genes are uh, transcribed. And then finally, uh, we talked a little bit about, or Dr. Sedman did, about um, Cas CRISPR and how this is used originally in bacteria um, to give it a memory of viruses that its ancestors have encountered. So it actually cuts a piece of the incoming viral DNA and packages it into the CRISPR site, uh, and then that allows it to be recognized later, if assuming that uh, the ancestral um, bacteria survived, that uh, the offspring of that ancestral bacteria then uh, have some kind of a genetic memory of that particular virus. And the Cas9 protein can then recognize that and cleave it and um, be protective for that uh, particular bacteria from um, incoming viruses. Okay, so that's it, folks. Um, for those of you who are taking the final, um, good luck with that. And again, I've uh, reserved McKenzie Hall 3198 uh, Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. March 17th uh, up on the top of Pill Hill, not at the South Waterfront. And uh, for those of you who are taking the exam, I uh, wish you good luck and I'll see you then. Bye.